Hey, welcome to the Bald Truth Leadership Podcast, a place where you get the straightforward, no-nonsense, no-holds-barred ideas on leadership and growth, both personally and professionally. I'm your host, Coach Rick Colster. Today, the Bald, Bald Truth is brought to you by the Peak Performance Group. We're going to talk today with a guy, and I just got to tell you this, this is a guy's guy, a man's man. Uh, he's kind of that guy that we all kind of want to emulate at some point in our career or have like some of those experiences. He's a leader, a businessman, former naval officer, and top gun pilot. I mean, go figure already. And on top of that, he's also an executive producer for and a filmmaker, so making films that support our veterans in transition to civilian life. He, he himself refers to himself as a bold and audacious fun lover, which is what I love about him a kick-ass coach, and all-around bon vivant. Now, I'm not really sure I know what that means, but we'll find out during the, the interview today. I'd like to welcome to the bald truth, Top Gun fighter pilot, executive coach, and lover of fine clothes, whiskey, and cigars, Captain Drew Brugal. Welcome to the bald truth, Drew. Hey, Rick. Thank you very much. I'm uh, really humbled to be here with you. Oh, no, you're a humble guy, absolutely. But the fun part is, is... All that stuff, as exciting as it's true, folks. This guy, he's a Top Gun pilot. And I think I was thinking about this the other day. You know, they had to put off through the COVID crisis they, the premiere of the Top Gun movie. And, you know, you did that. I mean, I'm going to start there. I'm jump, I say, I go, oh, where am I going to start? I'm starting there. Yeah. How much fun is that to fly an F 14? Well, you know, uh, there's a saying among uh, among naval aviators that uh, landing on an aircraft carrier at daytime is uh, the most fun you can have with your pants on. And <laughs> I believe that's the absolute truth. Uh, but you pay for it when you go out and, uh, and have to land at night. So it's quite a, quite a difference between day and night. Uh, I love my, my time in uh in the navy flying fighters and but i want to you know your introduction uh was somewhat humbling and embarrassing but i want to tell you something that i learned uh after my first change of command uh and i actually attended it as uh someone else's change of command and the guy uh walked up to the, the commanding officer after he'd taken his pin command pin and moved it to the other side, meaning he's no longer the commanding officer. And uh, a friend of mine walks up and says, hey, didn't you used to be somebody? And that, that kind of tells you everything, that uh, all through life, you transition from being a big shot to having to do something else. Now, that's, that's got to be a humbling experience. It. That's got to be a humbling experience right there. I got to tell you. Didn't you used to be somebody? Oh, I mean, talk about a kick in the oh, shins wow. or a little bit higher up for us guys, right? Yeah, yeah how fun. So let's, yeah. let's see, where do we start? We had a little fun with Top Gun here, exactly. but you're so multifaceted. And we've met through some mutual friends. And I, it's hard to pick a starting point for where do we go, but let's just jump in and figure out where we go from here. Um, I know from your experience, you know, to be a, a naval avi aviator, number one, is, is a heck of an accomplishment to then go through Top Gun and then go through command. And I mean, cause you, you were the, the XO of a, an aircraft carrier, biggest thing the Navy's got. Um, it, so it, it says to me, you've got a pretty strong work ethic. That's true. Yeah, that's Where does that come from? And how can someone take from your experience? Cause we want to share some leadership thoughts with folks. How can someone strengthen their work ethic? Where's yours come from and how can someone really work on their own work ethic? What advice would you give them? So uh, that's, that's a great question, Rick. And uh, it, it causes me to, to, to think a lot about it because, you know, I don't give it a lot of thought. Uh, and I don't know if it's really can be described as a work ethic. What it is, is that uh, from the way I grew up as an athlete, I, I love a challenge okay. and I love winning. 
Mm -hmm. And uh, I oftentimes see every day as, okay, what is it that I want to do today? And I, I then make that my challenge for the day and how am I going to accomplish it? Uh, when I get a new job, uh, I, I sort of tend to look at what it is that I want to see at the end. And, uh, and then every day I try and whittle away a little bit of, of getting to that sort of thing. Mm -hmm. Uh, and I, I think it, it served me well. Um, I don't have a plan in place. Uh, I'm not a very structured individual. Uh, I, uh, I'm, I tend to be more spontaneous. I have certain beliefs that inform me. They, they ground me. And they're the things that I, uh, they're the things that I structure my life around. Yeah, that, beliefs, I think that, that, that resonates real strongly with me, is but when we have beliefs, belief systems from a leadership perspective, I think that drives our, our, our decisions, our behaviors, our actions, all the things that we do. You know, I, I call it core values. You know, what are the core values or belief systems that you have? What are those? How important is that I mean, from a leadership perspective for you, having led thousands of men? Uh, for, how important is it to have those clearly defined? I think it's extremely important. Uh, and, and you have to review them and, and, and understand them all the time. And, and I'll tell you what, let me, you know, in, in preparation for this, because I knew it was probably going to hit on this, this topic. Um, I, I want to read you. There's, uh, <laughs> there's six of them. Uh, okay. And it's actually, so, and I started this, when I, uh, when I had my first major leadership job, which is running the, the maintenance department for an F-14 squadron, and this was before we were going to go into uh, Desert Shield, Desert Storm. Okay. Um, and I, I took over the job and uh, I created a PowerPoint presentation. I'm not going to put it up uh, here, but I'm, nice. I'm going to read some things. And it's broken down into uh, – Five, four different categories. And it's the things I believe, and that's what we were just talking about. Sure. Th things that I like, things that I don't like, and things I won't tolerate. So Fair enough. My belief structure, the core values, if you will, is, uh, and this is number one, and it always has informed the way I act. Uh, if people come first, the mission will follow. Okay, good. I believe that uh, you make your own luck, and we can talk about that a lot. Uh, it's amazing how luck comes to those that work hard. Uh, Curious, think, isn't it? <laughs> Curious, isn't it? <laughs> yeah, it is. Uh, I believe that uh, you should never think if it ain't broke, don't fix it. I also believe that uh, my success is due to those I have working around me. Uh, I believe success is a habit. And then this one sounds uh, Navy specific, but it's the same thing whether you're in the private sector or not, is ask the chiefs. For those that okay. aren't uh, familiar with the Navy, the chiefs are that middle management. They're the senior most enlisted people. Uh, and you can equate that to the foreman on the line, the product manager, uh, the, that, that individual that is skilled and knows exactly what the task at hand is and is responsible for running the crew directly. It's not the executive. It's not the commanding officer. It's the chief. And uh, they're the ones that are the foundation of any organization. Well, is it, and that, that's so true. They say always uh, have a good first sergeant. Yep, same thing. You know, because you know, we both, I mean, you obviously have a military background. My family is, is all military, both Naval Academy and West Point. I mean, my nephew, he just got his Green Beret. I don't know. Congratulations. That's fantastic. Great kid, man. But yeah. you know, we got his second bar. He's, 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 he's checking the boxes along the way at 25, six, seven years old. But it, it's always said is, 
always have a good first sergeant in a platoon or a chief or w whatever branch that you're in. I think that's it in an organization. Who are those chiefs, first sergeants that are not the CEO? Because the CEO can sometimes be distanced from what's really happening out on the floor from a manufacturing perspective, from a sales perspective. Find the guys that are out there leading the guys that are doing the work that have come up through the ranks. I think that's a great example. I you know, agree. by in, 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 early 90s or something, I wrote uh, the 12 commandments. And I love your, your six points, but I wrote, I call them the 12 commandments for success. Uh, the Coach Rick's 12 commandments for success. And it, it, very simple, couple that I'll give a couple of real easy ones is, number one is do it now. And number two is if you're not gonna do it now, when will you do it? Make a commitment, take action, or tell us when you're gonna get it done. And, you know, and the other one is, is make a decision. Right or wrong, make a decision. Oh, I believe if, in that one strongly. If it's wrong, we won't do that shit again, right? But if it's right, great, you learned, and you learned a lesson. So it's, I think that's part of the, like you said, knowing the chiefs. It's interesting, and you mentioned the, the uh, private sector as well. Some of our listeners may not be aware that you spent time both in the military and private sector. So how does that transition? How do those, you know, it, and again, as a Naval Academy graduate, you spent four years learning how to be a leader. And then how does the, your military leadership training and skills, how do they transition to the private sector? So one of the biggest things that uh, I had to get used to was um, the what I, what I'm going to say is the 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 lack of camaraderie uh, that exists between the private sector as opposed to uh, the military. Okay. Um, you know, be, before we started, we were talking about uh, uh, some things, and uh, and one of the hardest things that again that I confronted was this whole concept of too much information, TMI. When you start getting a, a little bit into individuals' personal lives. And you, you can only imagine when you spend six to nine months on an aircraft carrier, or when you're the commanding officer of an organization, you know everything about your your troops. Uh, you know, you know where they're from, you know how they're what their family situation is. Uh, it's 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 a, a a tightness and a bond that is created that it and i understand privacy matters and, and human resource issues uh but it's something that i think is lacking in in our, our our private organizations and i think that's one of the reasons that some startups uh have been so successful is because mm -hmm. they're a small group they form a very cohesive unit they suffer, they work 12, 12, they work 20 hour days uh, and, and they form this bond. And then as they go bigger, all of this structure and distance starts forming. And, uh, but anyway, to get back to your, your, your original question, that was my, my hardest thing that uh, in, in my transition that I saw. Okay. Yeah, I, I think we're living in a world right now where and I've heard it a couple of times, and some, some of the books I'm reading, some of the things I'm listening are reinforcing it, is we're living in what I consider an outrage society. Everyone has to get mad at the other guy, because he just, just this morning on the news, and whichever political way anyone swings, because I, I, this is a, a non-political podcast, we just, what is, it is what it is. You know, everyone wants to be pissed off at somebody for because they didn't say things the right way. I didn't like what you said. I didn't like the way you said that to me. You offended me. You know what? Well, just your presence offends me. I mean, that's, I think that's a, movie, a line out of a movie, if I remember correctly. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, it's, but yeah, so what? Get over it. Put on your big boy pants and let's go. You yes. know, why, why do we live that? And what happens is, when I become outraged, this is what I, I, I was heard this and it was like, wow, it was like an enlightenment. When I become outraged or offended at something you say, I own you. Because all yeah, you we want to do- You take up space in a guy's head. I don't want you because, living in my head. And all of a sudden now I'm going to have to go, oh, whoa, 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 wait a minute. I'm so sorry. I didn't do me. They mean to offend you because we don't want to offend. You know, I don't, I'm, this is the bald truth, brother. I don't give a rip straightforward, no nonsense. You're getting it square in the nose. 
So Rick, let me ask you a question because you're 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 I I sense you're the kind of guy that probably when you were a young kid uh, took a slug at another kid after tossing a couple of fuck yous back and forth. <laughs> and and what I've discovered oftentimes, uh, you know, some of those guys that fuck you, no fuck you, we end up being the closest friends uh, throughout our lives. And yeah, you know, we offended Amen. each other. But once you get past that surface level and you start digging into, you know, what really comprises somebody's soul, that's when you start building these tight bonds. And you can't get there if you're offended every time. That's right. Yeah, and you're, you know, you're absolutely right. I was more of a pacifist young, younger. Yeah, right. I can see that. No, I'm a, I, I was the guy that would, let's not fight, let's do this. Oh, okay. But if you, you press the button, it's go time, it's go. And it, there's no, the, the, the reins are off. But sure. my best friend, the guy who's my, been my best friend for 50 plus years, he and his big brother used to, we used to go home from Catholic school and they would beat me up getting off the bus. And I, <laughs> they lived two blocks away. I get off in the two of them. We're all like 12 months, you know, they're Irish, he and his brother are Irish twins. So, you know, 11 months apart. Right. So they would just, just pound me. And I'd go home, I'm dead, I'm crying, I'm dead. And my, my old man would go, my father would go, stop crying, do something about it. So I went down to the basement, he bought those, those big weights, those old, uh, they were filled with concrete weights and got me a bar and I would lift weights. I was in the basement lifting weights. And, you know, I started growing, putting some muscle on. And after a couple of years, they, they stopped beating me up off the, the bus from catechism class. You know, it's interesting you say that. I'll, I'll tell you a story. I was, uh, one of my longest and dearest friends is a guy, he's an artist, a guy named John McGowan. And if Johnny ever hears this story, he'll probably remember it. But when we were in like the second or third grade, uh, him and a couple other kids from the neighborhood and I, we were playing this uh, game called Lava Tag. And I was a little chubby kid. Um, and not really very strong, something of a mama's boy at that time. And, uh, I was the lava monster. So I was it. And, it. uh, to be able to get out from the lava pit, uh, to go chase the other kids and, and, and get more monsters, you had to grab onto the swing and hold yourself and swing across out of the lava pit. I wasn't strong enough to do it. And I was stuck as the lava monster. As kids will do at that age, they started teasing me and, uh, and throwing sand at me and making fun of me and then eventually ran away. And I, I remember walking home uh, crying. Um, and it was about, I don't know, a quarter mile walk or something. So as a little chubby kid, it took me about an hour. And uh, <laughs> so that's a lot of crying. That's a and, lot of crying. Yeah, and my grandmother lived with us, and she's a four foot ten little Cuban woman. And she goes, "So, so Drew, uh, I, you got laughed at, you got you got kicked. So what are you gonna do about this?" I said, "Grandma, I don't know. I have no, you know, I'm all upset." And she says, "Well, you, you have to become strong. You have to be able to defend yourself." And <laughs> it amazed me because you know that. Ends up the next Christmas, I asked for a weight set. Uh, we put it down in the basement. I started, you know, lifting weights, started eating better, and uh, and and started playing some sports. Um, and it, you know, yes, now I could defend myself. I could swing across the the lava if I had to. Uh, and I ended up confronting these kids, John being one of them. And we talked about it and we became close friends and he understood where I was coming from and, and I understood where he was coming from. And, and it was a real learning experience and something that has stuck with me for quite a while. You know, and so it, there's an interesting parallel and I, I, we could probably tell stories all day long. In fact, we probably will at another time yeah. with a cigar and a nice scotch or bourbon. I like that. Yeah. And, but you know, it's, I, same thing. I mean, it, many people, some know, watch the podcast or listen to the podcast. You know, I'm six foot four, 240 pounds. I'm linebacker size. Now I'm older and I can't play that game anymore. But, 
you know, I, I'm not, I'm, I'm not the average bear size. I'm a bigger than average bear, sure. but I wasn't always, I got picked on and it took something like that, a punch defending myself. And they all went, Whoa, what's he going to do next? Cause we thought we could, and I could, I could have got offended. I could have gone home and, and, oh, and and mom and dad go to the principal, which is what happens now. No, I went down to the, went down to the basement, got some concrete blocks, lifted them till I could defend myself. And I went out and I took care of it. Yeah. And it's, it's funny. That's it's the, funny today's how, society is just, we don't do that anymore. No, we don't. You know, we, 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 we shield and protect our kids. And, uh, you know, oftentimes if a kid is confronted or has a challenge like that, the parents go in and they they they, mm -hmm. they blame the school or the, whoever's in the position of authority rather than you know let the kid deal with it and overcome it mm -hmm. uh, yeah. I think, you know that's really an important lesson that that everyone should have yeah i love that you know you had your grandmother live with you and uh i just became a grandpa about a year and a half ago first time and another one in in march but i have a little grandson he's 18 months old so here it is what I'm Papa. What's Papa going to teach him? Because I didn't have a relationship with my grandparents growing up. They were, they were just much older and they passed away by the time I was 15. I had no grandparents left. So it's at this, at this point, I, I go, okay, what can I teach my grandson? How do I teach him to be a man? How do I teach him not to be offended? How do I teach him to stand up for himself, do what's right? And I think as a leader, that's, that's part of our responsibility in, in the leadership role is not to take crap from anybody, but to do what's right. And there's a fine line you walk on that. So I, I'm curious to your thoughts on how's that fine line and how do you walk that fine line? Uh, I, I don't do a very good job of walking that fine line. I'll be honest. With I've you. heard that by the way, I, you know, in my research. I, uh, yeah, I bet you have. I, <laughs> I, 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 I tend to, to cross the line. Um, and, 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 you know, most of the times, and I'll, let's, let's consider this like a, a job interview. And I've told this story a hundred times. And, and this is ending up becoming a, a storytelling time. I, I hope you don't mind it. But yeah, it's, it's great. It's the truth. So, you know, one of the questions that, that you're often asked during interviews, it's what's the most challenging thing that you've ever had to confront. Uh, and when I was a commanding officer of a fighter squadron, you know, one of the things that you do uh, when your troops uh, break one of the rules, a serious rule, uh, an offense is called captain's mast. And it's, sure. it's like a, a trial. Uh, there's evidence that's presented. The, the accused defends themselves. They, they call in witnesses and all this stuff. And we had a young kid, and let's call him Aaron. Aaron uh, had been in front of me a couple of times, and this was like his third offense. And it was fairly serious. He'd stolen from one of his shipmates. And I was pretty much convinced that I was going to kick Aaron out of the, uh, the Navy. Uh, I was going to, you know, get, throw the book at him. Basically, take half of his pay for two months, restrict him to the ship mm -hmm. for two months, and then give him an other than honorable discharge. Um, but one of the things that I had in my uh, toolbox to motivate individuals, and you couldn't get away with this in the private sector. You certainly don't, I don't believe you can get away with it in today's Navy. I probably couldn't get away with it in my time. But I used to have a phone uh, in the room, and I would have the uh, mother's phone number for the kid. And I asked Aaron, I said, hey, Aaron, is your mother proud of you for being in the, the Navy? Oh, yeah, she's very proud of me. Well, what would she think if I were to tell her that you're here for having stolen from a shipmate? Oh, she'd be, she'd be, you know, very sad and she'd be upset and she would, you know, think less of me. And I said, well, let's find out. I asked the chief to call the mother. She gives me the phone. Mom. And, and I... This was a, a trick I used quite a bit, and it, it's very effective. Uh, and I pick up the phone, and I say, hi, this is uh, Commander Brugal. I'm calling you from the uh, USS John F. Kennedy, and I've got Aaron here in front of me, and I want to tell you something about him. And all of a sudden, 
Oh my gosh, I've, we've been trying to get a hold of the ship. Aaron's mom, I'm, I'm his aunt and his mom is in the hospital. She's uh, overdosed and I've got his two little brother and sister here. And we need Aaron home immediately. So I clear the room, put Aaron on the phone with his aunt, gets all the information and he, uh, and I'm, I'm gonna get emotional here. And, uh, and, and we talk afterwards. And I tell him, I said, you look, Aaron, uh, what I need to do is I need to send you home on emergency leave. But because of what you've done, what I really need to do is I need to restrict you to the ship. And my concern is that you knowing that, uh, I'm going to send you home for emergency leave for six weeks or a month, whatever it may be, and you're never going to come home, come back to the ship and do your time and, and confront what you have to do. And you're going to end up going AWOL. And eventually your name will get to the FBI. They'll track you down. They'll arrest you and they'll throw you in the Leavenworth for whatever amount of time and your life is going to be ruined. Sure. So um, if I were to send you home, can I count on you to come back? Absolutely. Skipper, you can count on it. Well, I, I, I don't know if I really believed him or not, but long story short, kid comes back, does his time because he came back and, and, and served out his penalty. I decided to keep him on board the ship. Okay. And we had some, some conversations. Well, and I'm, this is one of the things I'm most proud of. When I had my change of command, I got to name my sailor of the year. And since I've said that, uh, you know what, how this story is going to end. Aaron was my sailor of the year. He's turned himself around completely. And I said, after I pinned the award on him, uh, I said, Aaron, you got anything to say? He says, yeah, I would like to say something, Skipper. And he took the microphone and he said, you know what? The only reason that I'm the sailor of the year and the only reason that my life is turning out the way it is is because Commander Brugal was the first person that ever trusted me, put faith in me. And that, and that changed my attitude. You know, I, I, I love that. And I, I will tell you this, that's not the first time I've heard a similar story about you. Because, you know, we have a couple of mutual friends right. that we, we bump, I've bumped into here. And that, what a great opportunity for leadership to show someone that you give a crap. Because a lot of people, in, in the, in the, whether it's the private sector or in the military, they don't give a crap. They don't give a rip about their people. I think a leader has to, has to care about their people, has to want to serve them. And that was a hard, gosh, what a hard decision you had to make. I mean, that was tough. I mean, because you were walking the knife edge here. One side, mm, he, go, he goes to the brig. The other side, he goes home and maybe goes AWOL because, but I think the fact that you showed him, and I think leaders all around the world, any type, any way, shape, or form, if we show belief in it, we believe in our, our people. And we give them the opportunity to do what's right. My, my personal opinion is I think people are inherently good. Nobody wakes up in the morning and says, I'm going to screw up Big Rick's, you know, Coach Rick's day. I'm going to, Drew, I'm going to wake up and I am going to F up Drew's day. We don't do it on purpose. Now, it happens, absolutely. But we don't, we don't wake up with malice and intent, malicious intent in our brains. I don't think many do. And if they do, they probably need a little more psychological help than we can give them. I think you're absolutely right, Rick. I really that's believe so, that. But now, so helping people, that's been, that's been a thread throughout. Um, share with me real quick and share with our listeners real quick, one of the techniques that you used um, where you would literally go down and eat with the enlisted. When yeah. you were commanding a ship, you would go down and sit in the enlisted mess and have lunch, breakfast, dinner. Um, tell us about that. Well, uh, and that comes from early, early, early on, uh, spending time with, with troops. And one sailor said to me at one point, um, I'm really surprised that someone like you is spending time with someone like us. I was like, what, what do you mean by that? What do you mean someone like me and someone like us? He said, well, you know, you're a college guy and you're, you're an officer and you're all of this. And, and, you know, my, 
my view is that, hey, I'm no different than you. I'm just in a different position. And, and there's nothing that stops you, which is one of the things that, that, that uh, I don't like is, you know, a disrespect to a senior or a junior. Because you don't know if that junior guy will someday be the boss of the company. Sure. It's just age or it's, it's place, it's whatever. So, so that structured my thinking. And uh, I used to go, like you say, I used to eat with the troops and I'd put a little sign up. I'd take a, a piece of paper and I'd, I'd, you know, fold it in half. And over here, I'd write rumor control. And then I'd place it in front of me <laughs> and I'd invite anybody that wanted to come eat to eat with me. And like in any organization, rumors form and they run rampant and they sure. can destroy an organization because we're about to have layoffs. Uh, we're going to the coast off of Russia. It's all the same. People don't know unless you communicate with them. So I would sit with them. They would ask me questions and I would give them straight answers at, to use your podcast, I'd give them the bald truth. <laughs> I love it. Because, <laughs> you know, we got the same hairstylist. Yeah. And, and it's, this uh, whole COVID has not affected us whatsoever. No. Our hairstylist comes every day. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> We're still always looking clean. <laughs> and uh, and then, you know, I'd ask them. I'd say, and, and it, it's incredible how much power I get from learning what's going on with them. What are their concerns? What's making their life more difficult? How, what's the challenges or okay. the roadblocks that are being put up that are preventing them from, uh, from doing their job, accomplishing their mission? And then I'd be able to address those things. And clearly, the same thing carried over when I was running my two companies. Uh, I, I would go to the break room and I'd hang out and listen to, you know, the line workers and, and uh, the product managers, whoever it may be. And, you know, what's, what's going on with that? And, and they always wanted to know, you know, Hey Drew, what's your vision? What, 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 why are we doing what we're doing? Why are we creating the product we're creating? And, and I, I was in the defense industry in, in both the companies. And the strength of that was I was able to tell them, relate to them how the product that they're doing, the widget that they're creating, what it goes into, and how it makes our warriors more effective, more lethal, or safer. And then that gave them a, a, a purpose. Wow. Okay. This isn't just a, a little box that I'm making, but this is something that's going to help our aviators to not die. I, I love that. And from a, a private sector leadership perspective, from a, as you look, it's just general leadership, sharing that vision in an organization, a leader's responsibility um, is to be able to share that throughout the organization. And I love the way that you just Literally went down to the break room and say, okay, tell me what's happening. And opening those lines of communication. And when I, when I work with companies, that's one of the things is make sure the communication is clear. Make sure that they know the vision, they can articulate the vision back, and that it's clear and there's a good direction. Because now people can embrace a vision. They can go, oh, man, I, I can sink my teeth into this one. I can get my arms around this. I get it now. Uh, there's a great book that's out there, and I'll, I don't get paid or any for that, right? But uh, called The Great Game of Business by Jack Stack. And I was, I'll, I'll, I'll jokingly say forced to read it, uh -huh. but I was uh, my first corporate job 30 plus years ago. Boss says to me, hey, I want you to read this book. I'm like, all right, whatever. Okay. I read the book, and I was a, a young regional manager. I was just kind of starting my management and leadership career. And what it said, the essentially nuts and bolts was, was communicating to everyone in the organization why they're doing what they do and what, what they do and how it makes a difference. From the last guy that tightens that last bolt on, on the machine as it goes out the door off the production line, 
if he doesn't tighten it down the right way, what's the effect of that downstream? What's the costs, repairs, returns, et cetera, et cetera. And he understands that. So now he knows how important his perceived menial job is, is really not a menial job. Just the fact that you tighten that one bolt. And I and imagine on an aircraft carrier or an airplane, you want all those bolts good and tight. Absolutely. But it may seem like that's eh, not that important to torque it down to the right. Just I'll just it's there. Yeah, uh, won't but make you, a difference. You know why leaders don't do it more often? My why? Opinion, no. They're afraid. They're afraid to be found out to not being all knowing, to not being the smartest guy in the room. Uh to not having all the answers. People get thrown into leadership positions and they think that because they have the title CEO, commanding officer, they got to know it all. Yep. And um, I forget her name, but you know she's very prominent now on the speakership and and reading um, and 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 books uh, where she talks about vulnerability. Sure. Okay. Yeah. And, and being vulnerable is, is extremely powerful. You know, uh, I teach that all the time to my, my leadership classes. Is vulnerability as a leader is a good trait. It's a great trait. Yeah. It, it's, I, I, uh, in my first job outside of the Navy, uh, when I was uh, running a company making helmet-mounted displays for air, airplanes, fighter planes, um, I was able to convince my board to send me to uh, a, a leadership group, a coaching group called Vistage. And on my first uh, meeting, uh, they said, so, so why are you here? And I stood up in front of the group and I said, well, I, I got to be honest with you. Uh, I go to work every day and I don't think I know what the fuck I'm doing. And okay, just, like you, just like you laughed. They all laughed and they yeah. said, Drew, join the group. Yeah, no kidding. But no one ever says that out loud. Well, we're, and that's the fear. I think you're absolutely right. That's the fear. And, you know, we chatted briefly offline. Um, you know, why, why do you do what you do? Well, I just got to put my head down and go and do it. I, I don't know what I'm going to do. I don't know where it's going to come out on the other side. But if I don't take that step, go back to rule. Commandment number one in Coach Rick's Commandments for Success, do it now. And if not now, do it. When are you going to do it? Right. You know, everyone talks this big game. Just do it. And if you, know, if you screw it up, you screw it up. We just don't do that again. Uh, so well, you know, I want to be conscious of your time. I want to be respectful of your sure, time because ahead. I know you're busy and your stuff. Yeah, we've been um, bullshitting a lot. No, this is good. This is, this is, this is what the bald truth is all about. Two good-looking bald guys talking – Talking the, the real deal. I know. Thank you. And you, you, my friend, are the real deal. And I just want to uh, thank you. I appreciate you taking the time today um, to spend some time with us and our listeners on the Ball Truth and sharing some of, of your leadership thoughts. Uh, is there anything that uh, you could want to promote for yourself? A new business, venture, and, uh, a shout out to anybody? Uh, uh, something to let people know a little bit about you, how to get a hold of you if they want well, to? So I'm, uh, I'm on all the, the, the normal channels, Facebook, uh, Twitter, and, and uh, Instagram. Um, so, I mean, you can find me just under Drew Brugal, and uh, I'm the only Drew Brugal out there. Uh, so, uh, you know, I, I'm, I'm opinionated. I'm, uh, I'm a fairly liberal guy, uh, which is, doesn't normally match up with uh, – uh, being a former fighter pilot, but uh, you know that's it. I'm, I'm, you know, I right now I've uh, I've got a couple of clients that I coach uh, specifically. Uh, I've whittled that down. I I am involved as you talked about early on in uh, producing a couple of movies with a fellow out here from uh, Oakland that's uh, a a very uh, famous director and. Um, he actually did the uh, the movie Hoop Dreams, and okay. uh, he's taken a great interest in our veterans and the challenges that they're facing. So he's got some good products that's coming out, and I've really been uh, proud to support him and in, in his efforts. 
That's tremendous. That's I appreciate. It. And you know, we, uh, my myself, my wife, and my family, we're all big supporters of our our veteran community. Uh, my wife's a veteran. You know, my family, my brothers, my nephews, my father, my uncles, all all served. So it's uh, it's been it's a it's a privilege to watch that. And uh, hey, if he's looking for a, a stand-in stunt double, that's a tall, fat, bald, ugly guy. I might be available. Who knows? You know, um, <laughs> got to help a brother. Problem out. there is the tall part because I'm a short, fat, ugly guy. Oh, uh, you know, I'll get on my knees. I don't know. What the... okay. <laughs> All right. So before we go, is something we do every single time on the Bald Truth. So we want to know. We've heard all about the stuff you want to talk about, and it was revealing. And and you you got emotional a little bit in here. Yeah. But I I really want to just throw you a curveball. So there's there's three things that I always ask all my guests. Sometimes four, depending on how it goes, but it'll be definitely three. Okay. I'd like to know if you got to hold a dinner party for yourself, for six people. There's a dinner party for six people, um, yourself included. What five people do you invite and why? So does, it, does it have to be six? Six people. That's all you get. All right. You know, it's uh, because I'll be honest with you. Uh, what I'd really like to do is I'd like to have a dinner party just with my dad. And, uh, I'd, I'd, okay. Fair enough. I'd, I'd, there I'd, you I'd, go. You know, my, 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 my pops passed away. Uh, I was fairly young, you know, it was right after desert storm. And I, I never had the opportunity to talk to him man to man and to really pick out what, uh, what drove him, what, you know, what disappointments, uh he had in his life uh and how he confronted those and uh, because i think that you know that's really what makes you strong Mm -hmm. is you overcome those kind of disappointments uh i always admired him uh he was a a, a hispanic guy so we had a somewhat distant relationship so it'd be it'd be really fulfilling to to just sit down and, and and having a you know, I'd, I'd, I'd have him in all six uh, or five of the seats, you know, personal, personal Andres Brugal, uh, business Andres Brugal, you name it. Awesome. I, you know, I absolutely love that because I, you made it your own. And that's one of the things that I love about this question is it really tells who we are as people. So thank you. So now an article is being written about you uh, after you're gone. We all have expiration dates. We know that. But after you're gone, and they're writing an article about you in the newspaper or in a magazine. What's the title? Not what's in the article so much, but what's the title of the article? Um, soft heart in a hard nut. <laughs> That's great. I say so. Now, what do you do every morning? to set yourself up for success. What's your morning routine that gets you ready for success for the day? So it's interesting because I haven't been able to do it. So I guess I haven't been very successful during this COVID-19 thing. But, uh, I, you know, I've maintained a gym membership ever since I left the military. And I go, as soon as it opens at 5 a.m. when the door uh, gets unlocked, I'm into the gym, spend an hour there, and I. I find that uh, it's where I collect my thoughts and I, I typically am listening to a podcast, uh, catching up on, on what's going on and uh, it energizes me and it allows me to, uh, to get a clearer head and, uh, and, and a refreshed outlook on, on what's the coming day. Excellent. Exercise, fill your brain, fill your body. I love it. And I know a really good podcast you can listen to from now on. <laughs> Okay, good. Log it in. You know, you got a little self-promotion here. So, all right. Hey, man, I, I, just, I just cannot thank you enough for being on the, the, the show, being on the podcast. It's been amazing. You spent some great time. You shared some really great leadership thoughts. And that, that's one of those things that's just absolutely critical. And what we look for here at the Ball Truth Leadership Podcast is thought leaders, lead, people who can lead, how we can help leaders grow and become servant leaders. So I don't thank you for that. Well, Rick, I really been... want to thank you for the invite and uh, for taking me down this this path. Uh, you, you allowed me to reminisce a, a lot, tell some stories, 
And uh, I, I really got a lot out of it. So thank you. My pleasure. You know, the best leaders tell the best stories. That's what I've learned. So folks, you have been listening to the Bold Truth Leadership Podcast with Coach Rick of the Peak Performance Group, the company that helps people and organizations reach their potential. If you're looking for ways to grow your organization, whether it's sales or strategic direction, the Peak Performance Group coaches, well, we can help you grow with our proven business acceleration process. You can call us at 817-748-7425 or check us out on the World Wide Web at www.mypotentialplus.com where we'll contact you and put you in touch with the right coach for you. Remember, subscribe and like below. We're available on iTunes, Spotify, iHeart, YouTube video. Like and subscribe to, and get every episode. Folks, this is, ba this is Coach Rick, and that's the bald truth.